This is a Founding Media Podcast, produced at Austin Community College District. Welcome to Science in the Mall, y'all. I'm your host, Dan Dillard. Since COVID-19 has impacted the world, we want to focus the next few episodes on the work and some of the science being done here locally in Austin and in Texas. What seems to be a long time ago, in the year 2016, before anyone even heard of COVID-19, Lisa McDonald and her husband, Andrew Nerlinger, started a company called Pandemic Tech. Pandemic Tech is a global network of resources dedicated to bridging the gap between the infectious disease community and the technology innovation ecosystem in developing countries. With Pandemic Tech, Lisa and Andrew were focusing on pandemic preparedness abroad. But when a pandemic hit the United States, they knew they had to shift from a global to a local focus. That's how they started Texas Global Health Security Innovation Consortium, or TexGHS. Similar to Pandemic Tech, TexGHS is bridging the gap between academia, public sector, and private sector partners as a way to coordinate efforts to support companies working towards pandemic preparedness and response in Texas. Let's jump into our conversation. Lisa, Andrew, thank you for being with us on the show. So excited to learn more about you, your entrepreneurial journey, and the things that you're doing right now. Um, I am super interested always when I hear about entrepreneurism and the things that, that are, are being done uh, around with our guests. I'd like to know what the origin story is. So I'd like to start with, just tell me how you two met and what started your entrepreneurial journey together. <laughs> Andrew, you want to kick it off? <laughs> I'm happy to kick it off. And um, our our entrepreneurial story was uh, preceded by our personal story um, by many years. I won't say exactly how many or, other, or else I might get in trouble for that. Um, but we actually met on the before the very first day of medical school um, when we, we showed up to New Haven, Connecticut on our um, our pre-med school orientation camping trip, which is actually a thing. They send you in small groups out to the um, Appalachian Trail in northwestern Connecticut with um, not anywhere near sufficient supplies and hope that you will bond over the course of a couple of days in the rain without tents. Um, and that actually did end up happening. Um, as you can see, this bond is still strong. Um, we've been married for, um, oh no, I'm going to get in trouble, but I think it's yeah, 10 years. How long? <laughs> <laughs> We're, we've been married for um, now 10 years. And uh, I think uh, it's, um, so that was really the beginning of our, of our journey together. But we, um, you know, we actually took the leap from, uh, from the medical profession, from clinical practice together. Um, and in 2011, we found at our own consulting company called Enduro Ventures. Um, we worked with family offices um, and investors and helped them connect with healthcare technologies around the world. Um, and then that, that grew over time. But really, the, the seminal moment in this conversation was from 2016, uh, when we came up with the idea for pandemic tech, um, and Lisa, jump in anytime you'd like, um, but uh, we're happy to keep going a little bit more about pandemic tech. Before we go into pandemic tech, so you were, you said you were both PhDs, and 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 so I'm really curious, what does it mean to be a non practicing medical doctor? Yeah, we both have MDs, um, and so what it means is that we decided to do something a little bit different, um, which is which is something that was pretty common actually in our medical school class. Uh, several people have gone on to careers outside of practicing in the hospital, whether it be in investment or consulting or public policy, um, just things that touch on medicine and health, um, but not really directly seeing patients. And so we made a decision together that we wanted to try that path. Uh, as a career path, and it you know really um, it has taken a long and winding road uh, to to where we are right now. Lisa, I'll let, let you jump in here. Uh, how, what does it mean f uh, to have a background in medicine, and how does that affect your day to day work? <laughs> So my background in medicine affects my day-to-day -day work quite a bit. Um, and my day job, I run a healthcare um, business incubator at the University of Texas at Austin. And so I have the opportunity to work with, you know, medical devices, diagnostics, therapeutics, digital health and telemedicine technologies. So really all the technology that underpins the, the healthcare system and 
daily life today. And so it's very useful um, to to have a background in medicine. It's probably a very expensive um, perspective to be able to give people. Um, but it's also a, a sort of interesting thing is a lot of times I'll be working more and more with entrepreneurs that they themselves come from a medical background. And so there's certainly a level of understanding about the path that people have taken to get to a certain place, maybe what their motivations are for starting a business or developing a piece of technology. So that's sort of an unintended um, unintended consequence or an observation of, of being in this position where you're working with startup companies, but you have, you know, you've got a background as, uh, as a medical doctor. Now, Andrew, you were talking about, uh, or you're about to start talking about pandemic tech. I'd like to jump more into, into understanding what that's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, we, we always, I think the, the main reason we, we made the jump from clinical practice towards um, technology development is because we kind of saw the potential that was there. And really, it's something just kind of captured, captured our interests, uh, quite frankly. Um, we got started working in the venture space uh, in Houston, working on telemedicine, digital health, early stage technologies, um, had the uh, in, incredible opportunity to really be mentored in that and, and get connected within the venture capital community by a former astronaut named Bernard. Oh. Harris, wow. um, who is a who who does pretty much everything. Um, he is a physician, also a doctor, and, yeah, <laughs> an endocrinologist. He um, is an astronaut, the first African American to conduct a spacewalk. Um, did the first telemedicine um, uh, conference from space, and then when he retired from NASA, turned into a venture capitalist, which is of course the logical thing to do. So um, he's he's done a little bit of everything, and it was really working with him that we got. Um, both our exposure into the VC space, but then also um, really started working with telemedicine and digital health technologies, focused very heavily on global health and how you can use telemedicine and digital health to improve access to care in you know places around the world. We took trips to Africa, to India, and had projects there. And so got a firsthand look at what some of the needs were. And Pandemic Tech was kind of born out of a trip to Ethiopia in 2016 that uh, Lisa and I had the opportunity to, to go with Dr. Harris and a team from MD Anderson to participate in a, it was called the first lady, what was it called, Lisa? It was like the first ladies, it was all the first ladies in Africa put together this cancer conference yeah. um, at the African Union. So we got to go into the big hall um, in the African Union and we got to meet a lot of the the really, um, all the, you know, the health ministers from different countries. We met Dr. Tedros there for the first time, who's the current director general of WHO. Um, at the time, he was the um, the uh, foreign minister for Ethiopia. Um, and, and But what we saw through that, we, there was actually a fortuitous um, meeting that took place there, is we went to meet an Ethiopian scientist who was working on, um, working on a project uh, related to developing a novel diagnostic um, for a parasitic disease called leishmaniasis. And um, he was looking for help with kind of design and prototyping and how to actually bring this to scale. So it occurred to us that there was an opportunity to hear, to connect people who were kind of on the front lines of dealing with these issues mm -hmm. to, um, to resources from the international community, whether it be um, engineering, funding, prototyping. And so that kind of launched this pandemic tech project, which is really meant to kind of create a formal structure um, and really a health tech ecosystem. Yeah, that was what I was going to ask next. Is this a company? Is it a structure? Is it a, what, what is pandemic tech? So um, Pandemic Tech is structured as a for-profit entity. Um, there's there are several different reasons for that, but one of the one of the most relevant reasons is it gives us the ability to make both grant and equity investments right. in companies, and that's something that's sort of taken shape over time. It, we didn't we did not start a company immediately in 2016. There was a lot of groundwork that was laid, and we were initially working this as a really as a project within that mm -hmm. Endura Ventures, okay. um, and uh, we kind of got a critical mass of interest and um, from different projects. Projects um, and and from different stakeholders and spun it out as a standalone um, as a standalone LLC in 2019. Maybe a question that may or may not get Andrew in trouble, but what's it like to work together with your spouse? <laughs> <laughs> they, Notice how I didn't ask Lisa that question. <laughs> What, what's the what's the saying, Lisa? Is that um, if, it's, yeah? If it's, you're if you're married to your business partner, your marriage is uh, the years of your marriage are measured in dog years. So we've been <laughs> we've been married for seventy. Years. Wow. <laughs> so it's uh, no no it's actually been wonderful. Um, you know we've we've been working together in, in different ways, shapes, and form. Even um, you know we remember our time back together in anatomy lab in med school, which uh, so that was a different kind of partnership. But no, it's been really nice because it's uh, especially during the the pandemic. Um, you know, you're kind of, you know, stuck at home, stuck in the office, not seeing other people. So this has been a really great 
um, a great chance for us to kind of work together on something and build it together and, and actually see it grow during, you know, during the pandemic um, and to work together on spinning it out into, you know, different things, um, uh, which is really kind of what the Texas, the Tex GHS program um, was. That was kind of the origin of that. Yeah, that was that was where I was going to go to next. Uh, Tex GHS. What what does it stand for and, and how did it come together? Sure. So um, TexGHS stands for the Texas Global Health Security Innovation Consortium. So global health security is a catch-all term that really describes pandemic preparedness and response. So everything that we're going through right now, it was a small community prior to, I guess now, geez, it's you know, six or seven months ago. And mm-hmm. then COVID comes across and, you know, infectious disease and pandemic infectious disease is immediately thrust onto the world stage. Mm-hmm. You know, we had been in this space, right, with pandemic tech since 2016, creating networks and tapping into subject matter expertise and, and really familiarizing ourselves with the space. And so certainly you can imagine with a name like pandemic tech alone, we got a lot of inbound interest as soon as the hot zone became New York City and the hot zone became Houston, Texas. Um, and and we start so some of that um, some of that interest uh, aligned with our focus at Pandemic Tech, which is really outside of the United States in low and middle income countries. And some of it was really coming from you know coming from within our own networks, our own ecosystems in our backyard here in Texas, here in the United States. And so Andrew and I had a conversation and thought, you know, we've been spending all of this time and you know and racking up some experience uh, and expertise and networks in creating innovation ecosystems from scratch outside of the United. States. So how do we do a similar thing, you know, in, in the state of Texas, where you have a rich, in some, in some sense, an over-resourced innovation ecosystem, what, what goes into creating the same sort of framework thematically around health security here in Texas and really what it, what it has involved and the, the, task in that instance is is about doing the legwork to pull together existing resources to formalize um, you know previously informal relationships and you know across the state of Texas and make sure that if there is an innovator that's working on a technology in the you know in the health security space working on a piece of technology to address COVID-19 they know that there is one place that they can go they will get connected with all of the relevant people in our ecosystem and we can speed and ease their path to market. You know, there's a saying, knowledge is power, right? But if you don't know who is working on what, then it's it's one of those things where you miss out on a whole bunch. And it sounds like what you guys are putting together is let's put these resources together so at least we know where to go to get connected. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. That's so and this cool. was this was coming. This was actually you know, it's been a very very challenging thing to organize um, mm-hmm. because it's been so popular. It's been incredible to see the number of organizations and people that have gotten involved with this. There are about eighty people regularly donating their time, volunteering, spending hours a week on this, um, unpaid because they really believe in it. But really, the cool thing that that happened. Um, you know, a lot of these partners are already working together. Um, mm-hmm. And if they weren't working together formally, they were still talking together um, all the time. There's the Life Science Affinity Group here in town, um, which a lot of people are doing biotech and life science innovation. So they're already talking together. Um, but when we we thought about it, we said, well, someone should be organizing, uh, should be organizing this. Then it occurred to us, well, wait a second, this, we should be organizing this. Like, we have experience and are able to do this. Um, so this is the time for us to do this. Um, so it's been it's been incredible to see how, um, you know, starting with kind of a, a handful of like seed partners, essentially, um, you know, be it whether from the University of Texas at Austin or from ACC and the Bioscience Incubator um, were two of the really key initial initial partners. But then it's been incredible to see the organizations from all over the world that have wanted to be a part of this. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the work that you've been able to accomplish? I mean, obviously, since March, some of the things that you've been able to do. Yeah, so I guess the first the first step that we took because you know I had I had my own you know my own be- beliefs or my own hypothesis about how many people were working on COVID related technologies, but we wanted to take a step back and really identify who would be interested on the innovator side in taking part in in an ecosystem like this. And so we just sent out a survey, asked people to indicate at a very high level what they were working on, and then two or three areas of interest um, or two or three areas of support that they were requesting and areas that they needed. And we got an overwhelming response from that. And we continue to get a response to that survey. We've used those entries to populate a database of companies that are working on health security related technologies. And, and we've also observed some trends. You know, people are indicating that they need assistance in, in three major buckets and then, you know, various other, other areas. Those are funding, 
Mm -hmm. um, subject matter expertise and partnerships. And almost everyone has those same, you know, those same requirements, those same needs. And not just small companies is the unique thing. You know, we've spoken with larger, you know, larger established companies, um, both here in Austin and then across the state of Texas. And we find that while they are in a position to give and to support on the resource side, they also might, you know, in some instances have two or three areas, you know, specific things. Maybe they need clinical samples or maybe they need access to a specific piece of equipment or access to another resource in the ecosystem. So there's a nice, there's a nice mix of kind of give and take across the ecosystem and across everyone that's, you know, that's working on health security related topics. And so I feel like we're, we're really filling a need. As, as, as you guys know, we were on this podcast, science in the mall y'all. So I'm really curious how ACC and ATI have, have, uh, have been able to impact the work that you're doing at Texas, uh, Texas GHS. Uh, how's it been these partners and these incubators helped. Yeah, Nancy has been absolutely critical, and the ACC and the Bioscience Incubator have have been, I would say, formative um, for TextGHS. A lot of the conversations that Nancy and I were having, you know, so ATI um, supports on a business incubation capacity the Bioscience Incubator, and we and can I stop we, you right there and just kind of ask what ATI is for the audiences that don't aren't familiar with ATI. Yes, definitely. So um, ATI is Austin Technology Incubator. It's a startup business incubator for the University of Texas at Austin. It's been around for uh, 30 years, was initially charged with economic development before Austin was what it is now. And so we've had a a rich, you know, rich history of success, really supporting early stage companies, creating partnerships, um, making that, you know, making sure that their business, uh, their business case around the company is solid and pairing them with outside funders. So it's just nuts and bolts kind of creating businesses from the ground up and sending them out into the Austin ecosystem to generate, you know, generate funds uh, to, to churn the economy. And to put a plug in for ATI, it's considered the first um, university-based incubator, I think, anywhere. Um, so it's, this, is a, um, this is the grand dame of them. ATI um, has worked with the bioscience incubator um, since the bioscience incubator was formed. And so Nancy and I have, have that working relationship, but I would say that we're also very close friends. Mm-hmm. And we have, you know, we spoke back and forth, back and forth, especially once, you know, the the campus closed for spring break. And then, you know, the, it, the magnitude of the pandemic became apparent and we were having to have conversations about, okay, so what is access to, you know, what is access to the facilities look like? What are people working on? How do we support existing tenants um, in, you know, in the bioscience incubator? And those, those conversations quickly sort of morphed into more strategic um, conversations about what does this look like for the Austin area? And it really played into a very nice natural conversation about text GHS and, you know, and ACC has been, has been supportive of text GHS and really they're, they're exactly the type of partner that, you know, that we sort of pulled together and we're hoping to, you know, to be able to, to support through the formation of the innovation ecosystem. You have a wet lab, you have startup companies, many of those startup companies are relevant, relevant to COVID-19. So how best do we support them? And in the cases where it's, you know, where it is of interest, how best do we publicize and market their efforts to the outside world so they know, so they know A, the important work that's being done at ACC in general, um, certainly at the bioscience incubator, and then for those individual startup companies. We want to provide them with the support and the, you know, the lens to magnify and amplify their efforts into the, you know, into the, I don't know, the business environment. Very well said. Yeah. Um, I, I think that was great. What's next for <laughs> What's next for TX GHS? I'm sorry. Andrew? <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll, I'll actually add something, too, to the, to the comment about, the, about ACC and, and the bioscience incubator and how that, how that has developed and, and what it's kind of, I think, meant to people is um, there's been a real personal aspect to TX GHS, too, that we really didn't quite expect um, when we got it started. Um, you know, because, again, it, it started with form, like kind of creating a structure around conversations among you know, friends, people that are working together all the time anyway. Um, but the really neat thing is um, in the setting of, you know, COVID, where we're not able to see each other at all the events that we're normally able to get together for, you know, provided a really cool framework um, for everyone to stay in touch really regularly and all kind of contribute to the COVID response in a meaningful way. 
Um, you know, we, we look at, this is a long-term, um, this is a long-term thing and people get that, you know, this was the, the invite. There were a lot of short-term initiatives that really needed to be done. Things around like personal protective equipment collection, um, at the medical school, for example. Um, these are critical short-term efforts, um, uh, that needed to be addressed. But I think that people seem to be in the text GHS program for the long haul. Um, and I think that the personal, um, relationships and being able to kind of communicate with everyone on a pretty regular basis, you know, these groups are meeting several times a week. I, this is probably maybe the second or third call or uh, time I've been uh, seeing Nancy over the last two days. And that's a, that's a really great thing. Um, it's also let us get new people um, involved, though, in, in these conversations or to reconnect with other people. Um, one of the first conversations we had around TextGHS was actually with one of Nancy's, uh, the companies at uh, ACC Bioscience Incubator um, called Nuclean. Um, and uh, and the, the funny connection was oh, it yeah. took the ACC Bioscience connection to have us talking again. But the CEO and founder of the company is actually a med school classmate of ours. Um, oh, wow. And so it, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's bringing in new contacts. Um, you know, we've had as part of the, the, lead, the lead group, um, as part of the founding team of TextGHS, other people from within the community maybe that we knew peripherally. Um, I think a great example is someone like D Dana Abramovitz. Um, who was um, one of the people leading the South by Southwest health track. Um, and she got in touch with us. We had a, a, a you know, we had talked a couple of times, um, but she was really interested in working uh, on COVID and see what she can, she can do. And she's currently running the partnerships program at text GHS. And so that's just a new relationship. That's, that's been very, very meaningful for us, both personally and for text GHS. And that's just one of, of dozens of examples. So um, definitely want to throw that out there. Yeah, no, I think, I think you, you touched on something. There's, there's the work that you're doing. Obviously everybody's um, excited about having better health and, and, and dealing with this COVID issue. I mean, everybody's got a vested interest in this. How can someone help or participate? Cause I know that Lisa mentioned there's three main things that are needed with many companies. Uh, how can someone be a part of, or, or what are the things that the text GHS needs that, that, that will help even beyond what's currently doing. Yeah, so I think there, there's a variety of different ways um, that you know that we that people have been engaging. Uh, I think that probably on so if obviously if someone has you know has an innovation or they're working in a company where you know you guys are working on pieces of technology that have some connection to health security or some connection to COVID nineteen, not necessary for COVID nineteen because we're seeing a lot of successful technologies that are maybe you know preventing infectious disease or controlling vaccination, you know things like that that can remain in place and give some resiliency to our communities um, to prevent this from ever happening again. So if you, if you have an innovation, you'd certainly visit our website, record, you know, take the, take the survey. You, you'll be asked questions similar to what I talked about before, indicated a high level what you're working on and what type of support you need. So that's a very straightforward way to get engaged. If you would like to participate as a volunteer and sort of join our efforts, we have, you know, we have regular meetings. You can also just, you know, you can indicate your interest in that sense also on the website. And we will quickly involve all of you and bring you into the fold and give you tons and tons of work to do, but it'll be rewarding work. <laughs> but we're, you know, we are always, there's a huge appetite for volunteer hours for people that are passionate. You can be passionate about a variety of things because you do not just have to be, you know, have to be a physician or have to be a scientist um, to, to contribute to, like, to an effort like this. In fact, it's very important and critical for us to engage the community more heavily so that they, we can hear the voices from the community, talk about what their perceptions are of health security, what challenges they're facing, and then we can work to address those challenges. So that's a, you know, on the community side, regardless of whether or not you have experience in this space, if you're passionate about it, we welcome you. We'd love to have you involved. And then probably the final way, and I don't know if you, the final ways, um, we are always reaching out to, you know, to established companies and, you know, and partners in the ecosystem for sponsorship for the organization. And mm -hmm. so if you do not have time and hours, um, but you have other resources that you feel like would be useful to us, absolutely get in touch with us on the website. Right. Yeah, textghs.org I like that partners uh, when, you, when you talk about partners you're talking not only about people in the medical field but I would imagine venture capital or investors as well because there's the need there that some of these startups may need some funding and it's always good to have a Rolodex of those numbers correct yeah absolutely Andrew can speak to that he's been working on that this week actually yeah, no, this has been a big push. Really, the first the first thing to do was to get kind of the the academic community organized um, and and people on board, and I think we've been really successful in in doing that. 
And then kind of the second push was to really bring a lot of the, the ecosystem players, whether it be the um, accelerators, the, um, you know, the incubators, some of the different organizations like the Austin Chamber um, that support um, some of that economic development. Um, and we've done a really good job with that. So really kind of we're on that next step is the private sector engagement. And just this week um, in the venture space, um, we have new um, ecosystem partnerships with Ecliptic Capital, um, with the Southwest Angel Network, and with True Wealth Ventures. Um, and so, so it's been a really a positive response from the venture community so far. But again, you know, the, the more the merrier. The goal there is, of course, to be able to connect them with opportunities for investment. Um, we're getting a lot of companies that are inbound from Texas and then also really from around the world because this, this has caught the attention uh, of people in the global health um, security community. It's really the first... Um, it's really the first group like this that's focused on innovation. You know, there are a lot of networks. Um, one of our partners is called the Global Health Security Network, and mm -hmm. they're based in Australia. Um, but they were uh, created by some very prominent academ academicians in the healthcare and health security policy space. So they're very much a policy and education focused organization. Um, what TextGHS is, it's an innovation focused consortium. And that's something that, to our knowledge, has not existed um, focused specifically on this issue. And this is really one of the first examples um, after many months and lots of hours of, of effort. Well, congratulations. It's such a great idea and such a need. And I just, I just, you know, anytime you can share knowledge and, and we can all benefit as a society, I think it's such an important work to be uh, done. So you, congratulations on that. One question, back to your family. Uh, you guys have kids? <laughs> we do. <laughs> we have a little 10-month-old, a little 10-month-old girl named Regina. Okay. That's going to make work really easy, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you can respond to that one. Lisa. Yeah, I was gonna, what do you have to say, Andrew? Have you been have you been working hard? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, it's a it is always excitement at our house. Um, never a dull mo moment. Uh, usually our day starts around I don't know six six thirty, and it doesn't start with a cup of coffee and reading the newspaper. It starts with babies Changing. crying. Baby needs to be fed. Dog needs to be fed. Pause. <laughs> so it's a it is action packed from from start to finish every day. But it's awesome. That yeah, it starts with screaming about in a bottle, and then the baby wakes up. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a ton of sense. <laughs> but no, you know, it's been that's one of the nice things is that um, you know before uh, before COVID, um, both of us traveled quite frequently, um, mm -hmm. and and this has been an, you know one of the silver linings for us. And I think it's important to look at some of the positives um, that have come out of what was altogether a horrible situation. Um, is being home. Um, you know, we haven't had to travel. We haven't been able to travel, and so um, it's it's been a, just a really rare opportunity to be able to spend all this time, um, you know, with, with the little baby. So, um, that's really wonderful. You mentioned that you met the, uh, uh, who director last year? HWO director? We, we did actually. Um, what was that like? so we had the opportunity, um, uh, to go visit WHO headquarters last May. Um, uh, Two Mays ago, now time is blurring together, so May 2019, um, we've had a, a great relationship with the World Health Organization's Africa office and have helped them with their um, with their innovation challenge and their innovation platform. Uh, little known fact, um, the Austin tech community actually provided many, many of the judges for their first innovation challenge oh, really? that really they had good. in 2018. Um, they opened up this program. They were expecting to get about 200, 300 applications um, uh, to kind of be recognized one of the top 30 health innovators in Africa. Um, instead, they got 2,600 applications and needed people to help judge them. And so um, we had a ton of people in the Austin community step up um, and, and be able to do that, um, whether it be from, um, we had judges from Techstars, from Tech Ranch Austin, um, Capital City Innovation. So it was kind of neat to see that uh, Austin flair. Um, but anyway, we went to um, WHO headquarters and had the opportunity to meet several of the um, kind of the leads from WHO, including a, a really great uh, experience meeting and, and um, spending some time with Dr. Tedros, um, who uh, who does actually love Texas very much um, and uh, and had been to Houston before and and talked very very highly about it. Well, he's got to be a good guy then. 
He was extremely <laughs> nice. He was uh, super pleasant. And more importantly, he really seemed to have a, um, a, a pretty a huge interest in innovation. I think he understood and he, uh, even said that one of the things that WHO needed to do was think about how it engages the private sector. Um, and so um, we're thrilled that we have um, confirmation from the WHO for the TechGHS launch event um, uh, in, at our virtual launch event in, in October. And I think that that's going to be a, a really great thing. It's exciting to have international focus on something like this that, that's a Texas-based thing. Wow. So I'm just curious, Text GHS, how is the work that you guys do in being impacted or is there an impact or a relationship with some of the initiatives the state of Texas is doing? So the goal of the Texas Global Health Security Innovation Consortium is to support innovations that launch locally and grow globally. We've spent some time as an organization brainstorming areas of focus, um, vaccination, therapeutics, diagnostics, access. And so we have those broad areas of focus. But the next step for us um, that we've undertaken is opening up lines of communication with the governor's office, with the city of Austin, to, to help understand what their needs are and where the priorities of the state are. Because ultimately, this is this is focused on supporting the work of, you know, supporting the work that's going on in Texas, affecting citizens of Texas. And so we've opened up those, you know, those dialogues, but it's really important for us to, to keep that kind of bilateral conversation going. Um, and so that's a, that certainly is an aspect of the work for the organization, but we really want to make sure that, you know, that we are serving the priorities of definitely the state of Texas, certainly the city of Austin, mm -hmm. um, presenting and, and serving as a clearinghouse for technologies is the, that could, you know, that could help address problems that are happening at the city level, help address problems that are happening at the state level. And to be able to do that, we need to know where those priorities are and, you know, and, and make sure that we have the sort of a mouthpiece and the eyes on to, to areas that we can support the work of the state of Texas. So the whole point of this is not, you know, it's to support work going on at the state level, support work going on at the city level and help citizens with technologies that are market ready or near market ready. It's a it's a two way street at a really practical level. Um, you know, one of the first roles that the consortium played is when people who were in a political role saw ideas for things that they want to do. Whether contact tracing is a perfect example, it's it's much more difficult to put into practice, and it, that ends up being for social reasons often rather than technical reasons. But when you see a, a technology that you're wondering, well, should we be looking at this as a state as a city? Um, they can come to this consortium and both figure out if it's a good option or share the fact that the city or the state want to pursue technologies in this area. And then the consortium can share that need with, with all the members who are able to bring those technologies into reality. And then vice versa, different companies in the ecosystem may have a technology that they want to see. Is there a way to incorporate this in the city's efforts, in the state's efforts? And so um, the consortium can empower these companies, these startups, these innovators, these academics to basically see if there's a need for their technology. And if so, where's the best place for that to go? So um, establishing that, that two-way street is really important. So as far as working with the biosciences uh, lab over at ACC, what other relationships are, are being formed there? So with regard to COVID-19, there is indeed a lot of important science in the mall. Um, we've seen a number of different companies um, that are working on or have pivoted towards COVID-19. Of those companies like Macromoltech, um, and it's done a lot of important work on the modeling of, you know, of interactions to speed drug development. Companies like Arisian that's, you know, that's working on researching aspects of viral infectivity. Um, companies like Lung Therapeutics that had a previously developed therapeutic for, you know, for a very specific type of lung injury. Um, that we also see in COVID-19. So each of these companies, wonderful, you know, wonderful examples of biotech companies that have, you know, that were immediately able to, to sort of pivot or, you know, or focus their efforts on creating treatments and, you know, and strategies to address COVID-19. We are excited to talk to them as well. Lisa, Andrew, I loved the conversation we had. I, I'm so happy to know the work that you guys are doing and excited for you. And, and I'm going to hit the website and see how I can contribute as well. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely put the, the website links on the show notes and make sure our audience can connect with you as well. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank, All right, you. thank you very much. Take care. Thank you again, Lisa and Andrew, for sharing a little bit more of what y'all have been up to. I love it when efficiencies are built for the good of the rest of society. Keep up the good work. It's truly inspiring. If you'd like to learn more about Texas DHS, please visit the link in our show notes. Science in the Mall, y'all, is created in partnership between Founding Media and the Austin Community College Bioscience Incubator. To learn more about ACC Bioscience Incubator, please visit the link in our show notes. If you like what you learned, 
please be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend or family member. 